not mine. Yeah. <coughs> the Invention of Nature, Alexander von Humboldt's New World. That's a great book. Uh, he was the most famous scientist and explorer in the mid 1700s, right up until the mid 1800s. And he was the first one to suggest that humans are destroying nature. He wrote many books and consulted with kings, with the President Thomas Jefferson, gave Jefferson an accounting of Mexico and South America. He explored um, one of the tributaries of the Amazon River. He went over to the Andes and climbed Mount Volcanoes. And uh, then he explored Siberia. He wanted to go to India, but the English wouldn't allow it because they were afraid, he being a Prussian, that um, it would upset their colonial power. But at any rate, um, he influenced his work, his books, influenced many <coughs> environmentalists and um, scientists like um, Charles Darwin, Henry David Thoreau, and John Muir, who founded Sierra Club. And so the, uh, his influence went way in the centuries. And then um, <clears throat> it's interesting to follow the conservation ethic because uh, John Muir uh, convinced uh, Betty Roosevelt to make Yosemite a national park. And uh, Betty Roosevelt was buddies with Gifford Pinchot, an art guy from Pennsylvania. Um, Pinchot, uh, his attitude was forced or carefully maintained for humankind. And uh, he changed his mind when he went out to the Northwest and saw the destructive clear cutting, which incidentally continued in this, the, um, late in the uh, 20th century by Ronald Reagan, who, who uh, appointed bad cabinet uh, people for interior and agriculture. And you would drive out there in Oregon and Washington, and all you saw were wood chips on the road. But at any rate, um, Pinchot uh, influenced Aldo Leopold, who wanted to be a forester. And uh, Aldo Leopold, as you know, wrote the Sand County Almanac, which advocated uh, the value of open prairies. And Aldo Leopold taught Irene Call, who came to Central Illinois, and she enthusiastically convinced many people to get interested in prairie, including myself. So <laughs> here you have this conservation ethic being passed right on down. So the Cumberland County has been occupied by Europeans, us, for 300 years. And as a result, 99%, I'd say 99% of every plant is Eurasian. And um, there are ex exceptions, like uh, trees, they have longer life and they persist as natives, except Eurasian diseases and insects have wiped out chestnut, American elm, hemlocks are being destroyed, ash trees are being destroyed, so it's kind of a pitiful situation. So, um, now the exceptions, the valley of course has been transformed, but uh, you go up into the mountains where there's less human impact 
you'll find more natives. And wetlands being useless to humans, you'll find a lot of natives in the wetlands. Um, and uh, the, the valley woodlands have been cut over quite a bit now. And I have 15 acres of woodlands, of which there are many succession trees like cherry and, and uh, cedar, red cedar, but I have oak. And so I've seeded those wheat woodlands with spring wildflowers, and now I have 32 species in the woods. But they're gone after the tree canopy develops. So April and May, they're, after April and May, they're gone. So um, most of the valley has open fields that have been uh, open for agriculture. And as a result, it's ideal for prairies or meadows. So that's what I'll be talking about mainly tonight. The, the uh, flowers and grasses develop all through the summer, so you always have a, a regime of beauty. And in front of my house, there's 12 acres that are, is really attractive all year, all summer long. So, um, my place is very close to a Some of you, I think, have already passed by my place. Um, my prairie has about 250 native species. And if you count the trees, I have over 300, which is uh, quite a bit. So, we'll start the PowerPoint, and then I'll need the, uh, my tech assistant, uh, my son. This is in Illinois. I had the good fortune to buy a half a mile railroad, abandoned railroad railway. Now, Illinois has 0.01% of original prairie left. It's hard to even find these areas unless you know where they are. But um, on both sides of the railroad track was original prairie. Interestingly, on either side, there's plowed fields of this black loam. And uh, right now, it's actually a foot lower than this prairie due to erosion. That's kind of pitiful. <laughs> of course, this prairie collects uh, dirt from the winter winds. And uh, anyway, I have given this property to um, the Ari Audubon Society who maintains the, maintains the property, but it is permanently, um, permanently by own, actually the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission. Uh, controls it in actuality. Um, there's a lot of weird places <laughs> to find prairie, and I'll get into that. I formed a group of Jubilee Prairie Dogs, and this is after a fire of about 60 acres. This guy right here, whoop, and this guy right here is now the head of the dogs. He's from New Zealand. He goes back to New Zealand for winter, so he always has summer. <laughs> okay, this is one of the areas that we've worked in. 
I uh, collected gay feather seeds from the Rock Island line when it was abandoned. And uh, it's now a nature preserve, so you can't collect seeds. But I threw them out into this field, and they didn't show up for eight years. It took eight years for them to show up. And now they keep spreading. So it takes time. These are perennial plants that have deep roots. Uh, this is a pale purple cone flower. And uh, this is the Manitou Nature Preserve. Um, back here is the Illinois River. Before the last ice age, this was the Mississippi. And uh, there was a lot of sand and gravel that came down the, the original Mississippi. And uh, what happened? Oh, <laughs> um, the sand and gravel blew with the prevailing wind, and this is a gravel hillside. And uh, one of the um, sand prairies intensely interesting because it has totally different type plants. So we were talking about roots. They send down roots that are as deep as 10 feet. And uh, as a result, as you can guess, you can burn off the top and it still has, a, you know, two thirds of its biomass is underground. So it hangs in there. Okay, I've written a book. Um, I have two copies left that I got as uh, author price. It's uh, $99.79 uh, that you can pick up if you want it. Uh, to get it from Springer is $139. And Amazon sells it for $199. <laughs> so extra material. If you go on the Springer website, you can get uh, herbaria and seed heads plus seeds. So there's about 600 images that have been scanned into the computer. Now, most botanists draw these plants. That's ridiculous. You just put it on a computer scanner, and this is what you can, if you want to pass this around. You can get real. Uh, that's the actual life size. So if you print it out on eight and a half by eleven paper, it's. I, mean, I think I have it. On the next. Yeah, here it is. So it's. I I mentioned that to <laughs> Professor Rhodes, who just wrote a book. I think it was her name was Rhodes. But she wrote a book on Pennsylvania uh, plants. And I told her, uh, she was so happy to get an artist. And I said, why do you bother? Just scan it in the computer. Went in one ear and out the other. Didn't even make any impact at all. <laughs> uh, this is a grayscale that's 300 dots per inch. This is Hypericum punctatum or out at St. John's Fort, and <clears throat> I can guarantee that by naked eye you cannot see these dots. Here's an incredibly interesting scene. This is porcupine grass, and um, if you notice, it drops off the plant and impregnates into the soil with a sharp point. And then there are hairs that go up like that. So it's kind of hard to pull it back out of the soil. And then these fibrils are twined, and they change according to the humidity. So it screws itself right into the ground. And if it falls flat, this tail will upright 
in order to go into the soil. Now, how is that for bioengineering? Incredible. <laughs> and here's one of the largest seeds is compost plant. Um, there are not too many of those around, but they do come in. And one of the smallest, the smallest seed is less than, it's less than sawdust. I mean, it's incredibly small. And here you see the seed. You stir these seeds out, and it just takes years for it to be seen because it starts from this incredibly small seed. Okay, I recommend another book which is produced by University of Iowa Press. So you might be interested in getting that. It gives you another aspect. And, um, and bringing nature home. Maybe you've heard of Douglas Talman. He's an entomologist at the University of Delaware. <coughs> and he um, he, he advocates native plants because um, of insects, and insects, of course, feed everything, just about everything. And this is from Doug Downey's book. <coughs> Most native insects have evolved to feed on specific native plants. Native plants produce 35 times more insect biomass. Insects are necessary for birds to feed nestlings and are important to amphibious fish, reptiles, and on up the line. <coughs> Over 62,000 square miles of the U.S. have been made into sterile suburban lawns planted with alien plants and treated with pesticides and fertilizers. He really gets into that. Uh, since 1966, there has been a 50% decline in neotropical migrant birds. Okay, my son back there is into photographing wildlife. And we have noted a lot of wildlife have come back. I, I grew up on, well, I was, 15 years old when we moved to this farm, and uh, so I purchased it from the estate. But we never had much in the way of wildlife. We had 50 to 100 barn swallows that uh, we hardly <coughs> ever see any mosquitoes or houseflies. They really take care of it. And barn owls, unfortunately disappeared because it were two hard winters. And uh, one year we had seven fledglings <coughs> in our barn owl nest that we had uh, erected in the barn. Tree frogs, <coughs> I, I swear we've never heard of before. And now they're Serenades from time to time, especially uh, during the rain. Um, Eastern box turtle. And we live between Conagwinna Creek and Opossum Lake, so I get visits from um, Great Blue Heron, and my wife took this picture out of the upstairs window. <laughs> And uh, we also have green herons stopping by and kingfishers. Lots of turkey. Moving moth. These pictures were taken by Bryce. Common buckeye, pearl crescent, butterfly. Uh, the larvae feed on askers, so we have plenty of askers. Monarchs, we have lots, six different species of milkweed. Uh, of, of and uh, some they really prefer a lot. 
Eastern Tiger Swallow Tail on Brazen Reed. And uh, it's kind of interesting. I hadn't noticed this before, but I think this is a skipper. Um, skipper is already feed on grass. Oh, and also we have a black swallowtail, which feed on um, golden alexander, it's easy to species. They also eat the Queen Anne's legs. This is Eastern Tail Blue, which is a legume feeder. And we have Sleepy Orange, which feed on senna. We have two different species of senna. Unfortunately, our area attracts cats. We have 20 feral cats, of which uh, half are already incarcerated, either in the barn greenhouse, in the house, or in the chicken coop. I'll tell you, it's something else. So one of the cats brought in a flying squirrel. I haven't seen flying squirrels for 70 years. You know. This isn't common milkweed, it's purple milkweed, and 
it's kind of weird. Some years it doesn't even come up, and then the next year it comes right out of the ground. It's totally weird. Purple prairie clover is a big western plant, but I enjoy doing the difficult plants. <laughs> Butterfly weed requires a friable soil, like uh, uh, this is on Illinois prairie loam, which is friable, or you can grow it on sand or on uh, shale, loose shale soil. Northern drop seed grass is really wonderful. And it's a good landscaping grass, but it's difficult to grow. <coughs> Downy gentian is another one that is in the states around us, but not in Pennsylvania except in my place. It's a real beauty. It blooms in late September. Queen of the Prairie requires uh, wet, medium soil, or wet soil. And uh, I've never seen the seed germinate. It reproduces by rising. <coughs> so uh, it would be amazing to me if it would actually work. Now here's the easy ones. This is totally easy. Um, yellow cone flower and bergamot. Bergamot here. Um, if you crush the leaves, it smells like Earl Grey tea. And it's so easy. This is in front of my house. Um, in mid-May to early June, we have Lansley coreopsis that prefers dry hillsides. <coughs> and some years there are huge patches of it. Pale purple coneflower, if you recall, pale purple coneflower in that picture next to Illinois River, well, here it is in my place. And it just stands right out. Uh, this is mid-June. Blazing Star is uh, another one that grows at our place, but it's from the Midwest. Maximilian sunflower is late September, and uh, the goldfinch really love it because goldfinch, unlike other songbirds, yeah, they build their nest in the late summer when when there's seed available to feed their nestlings. So I've seen. Uh, Oh, maybe it was a Tesco, pick one of the goldfish off right in front of my eyes. Little blue stem grass, there's a patch of this around the uh, Possum Lake. Most of the grass is uh, green sedge, which looks exactly like that, except the seed is different. Joey Golden Rod. Late fall, late September, and uh, it's favored by monarch that are moving south. If there are any questions? Just pipe up. Um, this is wild petunia, and it forms little capsules. And whenever you know, like you have intense sunlight, it will split open but with a crack, and out comes a seed with a little tail on it, and it'll go 10 or 15 feet. So it, it kind of spreads on its own. Black-eyed Susan, Susan is a biennial, so it kind of disappears and shows up from one place to another, but it never totally disappears. Big blue stem grass, which 
which I, I have a lot of that. Um, what happened? Oh, there we are. Um, big, big blue stem. One, uh, I've seen it in the Grand Canyon of Pennsylvania. So um, you have to go maybe a third of the way in before you see it. And I think it's the reason is that it doesn't get bowed off. And um, one wonders about the original meadows that existed in Pennsylvania. Um, buffalo, bison, the woodland bison came as far as the Susquehanna River and they were seen sunning themselves in meadows. And one would wonder exactly what was in those meadows. Uh, the, and the last bison was shot, I think it was 1800. So a lot of names up in Perry County, Buffalo State Park, are for real. <laughs> and here's big blue stem in front of my house. It, it, uh, the wind rustles through and it looks like an ocean. Um, very Coryopsis is uh, from the Midwest and it forms by rising. So you have a patch maybe 10 or 15 feet in diameter and it forces out other stuff. Purple cone flower is often used by people in their garden. So I'm sure you've seen this one before. It prefers partial shade. Rattlesnake master, it kind of looks like a yucca, but the leaves are soft, actually. It's easy to grow. Canada anemone is another one that forms big patches by rising, and it'll do okay in partial shade. Now, the interesting part about this plant is that seeds, you put the seed down maybe in spring. It requires a warm, moist period, and then a cool, moist period, and then another warm, moist period, and another cool, moist period, and then it will germinate. And so the third year, you see the plant. But it's really easier just to dig up a, dig up a, a, Ohio spider wart is very easy to grow and it's kind of attractive. Green gentian in the hybrid with uh, that blue downy gentian. Um, green gentian, for some reason, will compete with Hungarian or smooth brown. It's amazing. You know, uh, not many plants can hack. Uh, Aggressive, smooth broom. Slender Mountain Mint, I've seen along the Appalachian Trail in the valley. So it's a definitely native here. Prairie Dock, there's huge leaves, and then the flower is about eight or ten feet tall. Compass plant aligns the leaves north and south. So here's the setting sun that's illuminating the leaf from behind. And that, you know, that plant grows about eight feet tall. White wild indigo. Interestingly, around June, you see this uh, looks like asparagus come up. And so it waits until June before it comes up out of the ground and then the flower is produced from that stalk. So it, it, there is an advantage. I can, if the weeds get too bad, I just uh, go in here in May and, and uh, 
drive a seat before the engine. <coughs> but uh, the wild indigo is an effective. There's about, there are over a hundred carrick species, and this one is easy. Mark said it's uh, easy to grow and it prefers uh, <coughs> wet medium soil. Doing the master, and this is a pink form. The usual form is uh, uh, bright purple. Easy to grow. Fragrant or sweet, mm -hmm. um, sweet black eyed Susan is another name for it. I would highly recommend it. It blooms from late July right on into September. And it prefers the uh, kind of voice, medium voice. So this is Western ironweed. Uh, New York ironweed is very similar, except you have to know the characteristics of the flower. New York ironweed has these little protrusions that come off the sepals. I showed you the the tiny seeds from this culver tree. And here it is in, in <coughs> Southern Blue Flag. Um, wet, it prefers wet, wet soil. Swamp Marigold also prefers wet, uh, wet soil. And it's an annual, but it reseeds itself. So there's no and this is swamp milkweed. I don't think the monarch larvae prefer this much, but they sure prefer butterfly and weed and <coughs> green uh, milkweed. Here's the my place in the third week of July. It's really the peak of bloom. Um, if you're interested in cutting seed heads and then uh, producing your own seed, you can use sieves, quarter inch hardware. Whoop. Quarter inch hardware or just a simple window screen for the small seeds. But, and then the prairie dogs, they just grind up the seed heads and throw it out as is, and it seems to do okay. Okay, the methods. Method number one, herbicide, glyphosate, herbicide in September, repeat herbicide in list areas, Sow, sow seeds into the dead thatch. But if you use a one pass with a rotator, you have to realize you're bringing up weed seeds. And then sow the seeds in late October and November. Um, most seeds, most flowering plants, need overwintering or a cool, moist treatment to wipe out the germination inhibitors, with uh, few exceptions. Like uh, plants leave coreopsis <coughs> just requires storage for six months. But grass seed um, does not, in general, does not require that kind of treatment, except for carex, the sedge species. Okay. Uh, method two, in established ecosystems, just simply sow the seeds before the first snow. Um, <clears throat> select spots with the least competition. And then for grass plants, um, I've used glyphosate treatment in mid-September and then plant in spring with a range field. That really worked well. Of course, you have to hire people to do this for you. And then for seeds, 
the Rankin Main very new nursery, they get a huge number of seeds of all types, woodland, savanna, prairie, and, but you know, they're up north. Earth seed is northern Pennsylvania. Now you would think there would be a problem with people type. Okay? And here we go. On the left was the central Illinois Eagle type in July the 10th. And over here, southwest or southeast Minnesota Eagle type, July 10th, and it's already going to seed. The plant says to itself, winter's coming, we better get busy and <laughs> produce seed. But <clears throat> it's likely the DNA sequence of both of these are identical. But there's a new uh, a new science called epigenetics that uh, whereas certain cytosines are methylated or demethylated and the hit chromatin histones are modified so that um, the plant can adjust to climate. And there's lots of publications out there that uh, show this result. The northern plants are shorter and they come to flower sooner. But if epigenetics are involved, then in theory, um, this plant will adjust to the Pennsylvania climate sometime. Okay, um, <clears throat> this is a 60-acre prairie in Jubilee Park in Illinois, and uh, it's, it's <coughs> an encircling method. You start, you start downwind and just encircle everything. Here's a all the floor rose that's getting nuked. <laughs> And uh, there are trees out there that will be killed. You know, early succession trees. And uh, <clears throat> to do this, you have to wear cotton clothing. Um, and <clears throat> long sleeves to keep from getting burned. I, I was stupid one year. I had a t-shirt on and I had a scar of food. And, you know, it just, they don't burn <laughs> Here's uh, my place in Pennsylvania. We have a huge crowd to help. You start downwind. That way you can control the fire. And here's nearing the end of the downwind. Um, and then here is a, a, a lane that we go up next, and as you can see, it really takes off when the wind takes it. This is uh, with the wind now. And due to the smoke, you can't even see the fire. But it's there, believe me. Out here, you can see a line of fire. How does this differ between your methods one and two with, with the burn? Well, the burn, um, I guess I don't understand the question. Well, it sounded like method one and two where you, you're, you're killing and then, and you're, what are you doing with the, the burn then that's different then? Well, I, when I so see, I don't burn that year. Okay. Is that what you mean? Well, I think typically what we burn a lot on the game lands and method one and two as far as spraying, I think he was getting to is you still have that thatch layer there. Whereas when you're burning, you're reducing that thatch layer and exposing some of that seed and tell me if I'm wrong, it 
when we burn a lot of our non-native species are fire susceptible you know they'll either pop the seeds or outright kill the plant whereas the natives are and the game commission has done fire history studies on all this stuff over 500 years of but the natives tend to respond better to the burn yeah. and you're reducing that thatch and getting rid of that that, that whole field was a big boost that mainly so it was very very that burn but i try not to put seed out uh, before a burn and <clears throat> if you have a suburban area you can easily mow in the late fall or the early spring and it would be the same effect you're chopping off uh, bushes and honeysuckle and stuff like that well is, isn't the point of the burning to um get rid of the woody plants and right. the other plants that would come in and compete right um, Where? I, right now i have a lot of um, fox grape and um, Honey, a little bit of honeysuckle and a few trees that birds, you know, they carry in cherry seeds. And so that will wipe them out. And you'll see a bush get nuked in one of the next slides. Plus, by burning, you're naturally putting phosphorus and potash back in the soil. Yeah, correct. Right. Plus, the soil is flat so the, the, the plants have a chance to grow early. You know, they, they don't have the thatch to come up through. Um, by the way, these kids weren't allowed to <laughs> Okay, here we go. It takes a while for it to recognize. See a bush walking plane through. One of the librarians here, um, the librarian assistant, um, took this picture. Uh, Penn State Arboretum folks have visited us uh, twice and uh, they, they have a prairie up there, they just established a prairie and it's in bad shape. It has a lot of weeds and uh, not much diversity so they come down to the right place to check it out. Spring is coming. <laughs> out there in the rain. I've never seen a person.
Yes. Yes. It senses yes. the environment. Yes. I'd like to know what would be the best one to plant to really attract the monarchs around here. Um, they really just made butterfly weed. That's a good one. When I say butterfly weed, I meant to say that. Which butterfly weed you want to get? Did you say that? But the scrap was, the scrap I asked to roast it. And, and uh, green flower milkweed is another one, okay. which is the Sclepius viridiflora, and uh, somewhat, there, I have a prairie milkweed, uh, Sclepius uh, salivantine, and they seem to like that one. And the last preference, which they will eat, is common milkweed. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. My son has a common milkweed, and every year I look for the eggs, and I never see them. And I thought, well, maybe he well, doesn't have the right kind. It, um, you could haul in. Well, I was I was just sitting there saying a lot of the butterfly weed plants that you buy from the um, the really pretty pictures and the magazines like like I get it in the mail are they've been high, um, the correct term they've been cross pollen they're not true um, they're horticulture butterfly weeds so I guess what I'm saying is prairie prairie moon is one of the people that provide what they call a pure strain of the butterfly weed plant. And they've warned people to be careful of a lot of the seeds that you get. They'll tell you it's a butterfly weed, but it's been hybridized a little bit or cross-pollinated with other things so they get the intense colors for it. So you have to be really careful when you do that if you want the pollinator garden because um, a lot of the stuff that's sold as a pollinator seed source is not necessarily the, the, the purest of the seeds. And some of the insects don't like it as well. They'll be attracted to a... A, a more pure seed source. I don't. I know, but I, I do know that the butterfly. Because I was talking to Prairie Moon about that, and because they're they're trying to get people to be just on the lookout, because a lot of stuff I get a lot of seed catalogs, and they've got butterfly weed in it, and it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. It's very very attractive, but they told me ahead of time, because I kept saying, well, maybe I can get it here and there, and he said, but you're not going to get a really pure source. And evidently, the butterflies are a little bit fussy. I'd say probably a lot fussy. Well, they, they just made our butterfly weed. So um, if you're, I'd if, recommend a pile of sand. Because if you're not, get, you're not getting it, it may be the seed source is not a pure seed source. Because I, they usually do come when you get the, the plants that they like. But I have mine growing in the sand, but it is growing on the shale hillside as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The best way to start a prairie is to start off in the last place. Well, I, I really had to take using the ground of privacy to get rid of everything to start with. And I'd start small to see how it's going to go. One, one of the things that we found, we found beneficial in that aspect is if you have situations where you want to get rid of things, mm -hmm. we burn it in, as soon as you can in the spring. Once it starts greening up, then we like to say that that way you don't have all that thatch and stuff competing for the your your herbicide can contact the leaf source better. So burn it, then glyphosate, then go to plant. Yeah. And you can do that all in one year or it takes two years? We can do, you can do it in one year. Because you're typically planting your seeds, like he said, in the fall. Uh -huh. Or even even doing a frost seed. Where well, you just grass. It's grass. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you, don't expect instant results. Right. It'll take three to five years to see things. And because they're putting down roots. You know, they're perennials, and their first order of business is to get that root in there. And also by getting rid of the thatch, the no-till cedar that was used doesn't have all the thatch it has to cut through the yep. seed in the soil too. Yeah, that's a good plan. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
What's an alternative to the glyphosate? What's an alternative to the Roundup, the glyphosate? Um, it's a, uh, you know, it, I don't it, agree, it, it composes after 10 days. So it's not of biochemists. The mm. most toxic part about glyphosate is the isopropylamine that use, mm. is used as a counter on it to the, the uh, uh, gly glycine phosphonate. So it really does decrease. It's gone in 10 days. There's no other, well, I don't know about uh, herbicides that are natural, <coughs> but I bet they're costly. Is there any organic way you can do it if you don't want to use herbicides? What's that? If, if you want to get rid of some of these weeds, what if you don't want to use a chemical? Well, you know, uh, for example, I'm here in Brown. If you dig it up, and the roots are still there. I mean, you can't get rid of all those roots, and they'll come right back. How often are you putting the glyphosate down? Just, the, Just once. Yeah. And then you, in this spot, you can spray. Right. Once, and yeah. then establish, like you're not doing that every year, right? No, just to establish the prairie. Right. And uh, once you have the prairie started, you know, like to say, it's only once. Yes. So to control the weed suppression throughout the first couple of years, do you burn it off every year and then mow it in the spring? Um, if you have a lot of weeds, they recommend uh, to mow about four to six inches high. And you do that maybe twice or three times. Each year until the prairie gets established? Well, you know, the first year will be the worst. But, you know, it takes, takes time. And then you'll be pleased. Jebony stilt grass, is there any way that you can deal with that? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, there's would, a study would you do the bird in the, in the roundup? There's a study a made by the Park Service in uh, that park next to uh, where the president goes, uh, in Maryland. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, they have a herbicide that they spray in July, and then they go back and spray in, in uh, September. Do you know what it is? Is it top secret? It's in the <laughs> there, there are several. We use several chemicals for stilt grass. One of them is called Alp XP. It's a it's a powder or a granular form. Okay. The problem with it is it's a non-selective, consistent, res eighteen month residual that's soil activated. So once it hits the soil, don't expect much to grow there for. Two no. years. And you also have to have a permit to apply. No. 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 There, and that's one thing that's a misconception. There are very few restricted chemicals that, uh, until you get into like uh, toured on, you know, really, really potent stuff, there's a lot of stuff that people think is restricted, but it's not restricted. Um, so. Well. You should check out the Natural Area Journal. I think it was December when they published that. And they named the chemical and they told you how it is. But, there, there's but also it's, not, it's not a nasty right. chemical. There's also a, and we're starting to see some of it here, but there's also a biocontrol that some places are starting to see on stilt grass that's a fungus that's killing it. Now, once it kills the stilt grass, I always have this question, okay, once it kills what it's supposed to, what's it going to go to next? So, but there is a bio with fungus that's starting to take effect, kind of like the rose rosette disease that's getting rid of the motor flora, but it's, it's slowly starting to start. I'm going to get some of that. Yeah, so <laughs> would I. It's like uh, the uh, purple loose guy. They brought in beetles that they decimated that. 
Yeah. We still have some purple loose drake in this body. We also have a beetle that's killing a mile a minute, too. But <laughs> Really? Well, no. <coughs> I was going to ask about mile a minute. They, if there's anything that can control mile a minute. Yeah. That's nasty stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I should have brought, um, I have a, uh, a folder with alien plants, you know, that I can show. But, uh, yeah, there's plenty of nasty, um, aggressive aliens. You know, like uh, the little snap, snap dragons that is from Eurasia is not a problem because it doesn't take over stuff. And uh, wild garlic disappears in the prairie because it can't hack the competition. And uh, blackgrass disappears. So I think. Which plant takes up the most sun energy? Well, um, the prairie grasses are C4 plants. So they. <clears throat> utilize CO2 better than something like soybean, which is a C3. But now that we have increasing CO2, it, uh, I've noticed that the C3 plants, like poison ivy and soybeans, are doing very well. <laughs> What's a kudzu plant? Well, what is that? Supposedly. Well, that climbs. Um, it's, 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 it's like a mild minute. He said they had done it's, it's a southern plant that is is an invasive vine that's kind of like mile a minute that we have around here, but supposedly it's creeping north and it'll just take over everything. It'll, it'll take over the whole house. Yeah. Yeah. Magnified because they're really tiny. Yeah. Like this. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I